Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Pastor Ben. Good morning, Lady Barbara. <clears throat> Hope that everybody is having a great and wonderful Monday. As you know, this is the countdown to the end of season one of Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shante Charles. For those of you who are with me for the first time, um, Daring Dialogues has been a media-inspired broadcast where we share about current events as well as read aloud from different subject matters so that we can grow and think. Uh, think and grow. Grow in what we know and think about where we are, what is the relation to the world and us and the relationship to other people and hopefully grow in our knowledge, our wisdom, and our, and our understanding. Uh, my, my tagline for Daring Dialogues is Light is the most daring opposition to darkness. And so hopefully um, this, since the beginning of this year, we have been able to um, educate you, inform you, share news that you can use, enlighten you on different subject matter. So I want to say, first of all, thank you to those who have been with us and hung in there and uh, have shared your input as well. Those of you who are in the conversation box also want to say uh, good morning to those of you coming in. Good morning, Lady Rochelle. Um, so we are on our last three episodes officially of Daring Dialogues. But as I said, um, we're going to continue probably until June 15th so that we can finish up our studies in Watch Your Mouth as well as the book on women. So I will do a couple of more episodes um, dealing specifically with those two books and um, I hope that you'll be able to join in for those but once we hit uh, episode 100 I will no longer be um, uploading those episodes to my YouTube channel so if you also follow me on YouTube you won't see episodes after episode 100 all right how many of you had a wonderful Sunday? Put some hearts on the screen. If you had a good Sunday, your Sunday was really, really good. We got a chance to, um, I taught yesterday on um, re repairing broken lives, repairing broken lives. And um, my husband was really encouraged by the message. And um, he wanted me to share with you all some of the ways to mend a broken relationship. And so I'm not obviously not going to go over the whole sermon because I ministered for about an hour. Um, but I want to talk just briefly about the 10 ways to mend a broken relationship. And to be honest with you, I can't think of one person who doesn't have at least one relationship that needs to be mended. Um, if we will be honest with ourselves, you know, some of the relationships that we had or we were in, uh, whether they were romantic or not, did not necessarily end the way that we wanted, wanted them to. And some of our relationships, um, you know, need repairing. <laughs> and we know that, you know, every relationship that you're in is not necessarily meant to be repaired. But for those who desire to mend a relationship, here are some points that you can consider. Um, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to give you 10 ways to mend a broken relationship. Number one, talk to God about the relationship and then talk to the person. Don't talk at them. <laughs> Don't talk about them to other people. Make sure you're talking to God first, right? And then talk to that person if they're willing to hear you out. We know that there are circumstances where um, a relationship ends so badly that the person is just like, look, let's just go our separate ways. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to hear from you. Um, but we're talking about a situation in which 
the person is willing to have a conversation. Make sure you are having that conversation, which goes into number two. Take the initiative to correct a known offense. All right? So there are times, <clears throat> excuse me, there are times when we offend people and we don't know that we've offended them. But then there are times when we know that we have offended people because sometimes they've, they've flat out told us, hey, that was offensive. I didn't like what you did. I didn't like what you said. Good morning, bespoke. And so, number two, take initiative to correct known offense. Number one, talk to God about it and then talk to the person. For those of you coming in, we're talking about 10 ways to mend a broken relationship. I also want to say hello to those of you who are watching by laptop and those of you who are watching outside of the app or via Twitter. Number three, be humble. Confess your part. Own your part of whatever it was. Um, maybe you didn't communicate well enough. Maybe uh, you dropped the ball on something and that caused the relationship to end. <clears throat> maybe you weren't as affectionate as you needed to be. We're talking romantic relationships. Be humble. Confess what your part was to the person. All right? Number four, attack the issue and not the person. Oftentimes, we lose before we ever get started. Amen. <laughs> because we are so bent on going in to attack the person that we never get to the issue, right? And so a lot of times when you're talking about conflict resolution and you're talking about mending broken relationships, the first thing that offends people is usually they feel attacked. They feel personally attacked and you're not addressing what it is that they did as opposed to who they are. I'm going to say that again. It is a very important differentiation when you're dealing with conflict, okay? If you come to me and you say, Shante, um, I have a problem with X, Y, and Z. Um, I don't appreciate how you did this or what you said. I am more willing to hear you than you coming to me and saying, Shante, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. Why? Because the language of what you just said means that you're attacking me as a person. You're attacking my character versus attacking the issue involved. All right? And the quickest way to shut someone down in a conflict to where you don't get it resolved is to attack them personally. If you're calling, if you're saying to a person, you're a liar, um, you are unfaithful, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is, you got to learn how to attack the issue. Maybe the person didn't keep their word, right? For whatever reason. Not keeping your word in the situation and not following through with something versus a character flaw, you are a liar, are two different things, all right? So again, number four, attack the issue, not the person. Number five, communicate well and in love. You have to start from a place of love. Remember, we've been talking about that in our Mean Girls book, you know, um, that when you do confront something, you need to confront it from a place of love. If it's not from a place of love, go back to the drawing board, go back to the prayer closet <laughs> and say, Lord, I need your perspective. I need a heart of compassion. I need empathy. I need sympathy so that I can address this from the right spirit. Because that's another thing. Sometimes we're attacking people personally or sometimes we come to people in the wrong spirit and then we want people to accept how we came to them. The world doesn't work that way, all right? Nobody, listen, nobody has to receive what you're saying to them, even if they're right. So you have to make sure that you're communicating what is the problem that you have to communicate it well and you have to communicate it in love. You have to be clear, concise, and you have to do it out of the right motive. Number six, sympathize with those you hurt. Here's another one we hear, especially um, in counseling people and um, dealing with reconciliation. This person hurt me and they are acting like they did nothing wrong, right? So sympathize with those you hurt. 
maybe you have never been in their shoes to have somebody do what you have maybe done to that person or caused um, conflict or offense in. I want to say keep living. <laughs> I had an incident where um, a, a, a young lady and her family had done something to me and it was pretty devastating what happened. But she said that she did not understand how devastated or how painful it was what she did until she asked the Lord. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this, but she asked the Lord to show her how I felt about what she did. And then the Lord actually put her and her family through the same exact thing she did to my family. And after that, she came to me, she apologized, and she said, you know what? When you were going through that, I had no idea how it made you feel or how devastated you were as you went through that. But now since I have been through it, I can honestly and sincerely come back and say, I apologize and I'm sorry for what I did and will you forgive me? I had already forgiven her because I was like, I don't have time to be holding grudges. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my destiny. But I just thought it was powerful that she was even willing to go to the Lord and say, put me in her shoes. Now, I don't recommend people do that <laughs> um, because you might not survive being in someone else's shoes, right? But the goal here is to sympathize with those that you have hurt. Show some compassion, show some empathy, show some sympathy. Number seven, offer forgiveness and ask for forgiveness. Be willing to offer forgiveness if it's needed. Be willing to ask for forgiveness if it's needed. That's another one that we hear quite a bit. Okay, this person came to me and they're talking to me as if there's nothing wrong with our relationship. Okay? We have, we have people like that that we know. They have ruined and wrecked people's lives. And they're trying to move on and act like nothing happened. And that is not working for a lot of the people whose lives they have wrecked. And you cannot expect someone to move on from an offense when you may be the offender, right? And you're trying to smooth things over without confronting what it is you actually did. So there are times when you're going to need to ask for forgiveness. You're not going to, in, in other words, don't assume that because a person is still in your life or a person is still communicating with you that they have forgiven you. Because nine times out of ten, they probably haven't. <laughs> some people are just kind enough to keep talking to you, but some of them are talking to you in the hopes that you will actually come out and say, look, I jacked up, I messed up. Will you forgive me? Sometimes people are just waiting for you to ask. They are. So you have to keep that in mind. Be willing to offer forgiveness and be willing to ask for forgiveness. Eight, emphasize reconciliation. And I do want to say this. Re reconciliation does not always mean that that person is going to return to your life. It doesn't always mean that y'all are going to um, go back to the way things were. It doesn't mean that um, the level of closeness that you share with a person is going to return to that. For some people, they return to a greater level of friendship after they are reconciled. For other people, it's simply a matter of we have, we have solved this conflict We've asked for forgiveness. Now let's move on. You go your way. I go my way. You have a nice, wonderful life. I have a nice, wonderful life. And there's no grudges being held. Okay? So the goal is reconciliation. It's not necessarily um, a rebuilding of the same kind of relationship. Okay? Just want to make that clear. Number nine, have patience and act, but don't react. Have patience. Sometimes 
You may go to a person the first time and they may not receive you. They may not receive you. They may not receive your apology. They may not receive you asking for forgiveness. To that, I say, have patience. Sometimes it takes people more time than we're willing to afford for them to deal with or get over what has happened. For me, I like to get over stuff quickly. I like to learn from it. And when I learn from it, then I preach from it. <laughs> In the hopes that I will help somebody else. Good morning, Prophet Jonathan. And so I would say have patience because the amount of time it might take you to get over something might not be the same for that person. So here's another thing we do as human beings, right? You know, we go to the person and they reject us. Maybe they reject us the first time. As human beings, some of us just say, oh, well, I asked for forgiveness. Oh, well, oh, well. So I'm going on about my business. But sometimes God requires you to be patient and he requires you to be persistent in showing that you've changed. Mm -hmm. In showing that you have a different behavior pattern. Sometimes that person needs to see that you've changed. And sometimes that takes time. All right, so have patience. And lastly, number 10, be invested in deep connections. Be invested in deep connections. What does that mean? That means the relationships that can be re re reconciled and the relationships that can be restored and the people who are saying, look, I want us to start with a clean slate you and that person would have to both be committed, committed to reestablishing that relationship. In other words, if there's a deep connection and you believe that this is worth a, this is a relationship worth investing in and worth keeping and worth going beyond a surface relationship, then be invested in that relationship. All right. So that was from yesterday, 10 ways to mend a broken relationship. And that was actually taken from um, Genesis 33 and the story of Jacob and Esau and their reconciliation. All right. So watch your mouth. We've been having a good time in this book and we're going to be covering this book today and tomorrow. So let's see what we can get through today. We're on the chapter talking about God in your gums. God in your gums. <laughs> Tony Evans likes to come up with all of these different uh, rhythmic titles here. So we stopped at talking about how God created our mouth. And God is fully aware and in charge of our mouth if we give him the ability to be in charge of it. And uh, we're moving into a section called Wasted Words and Who is Calling the Plays in Your Life. Wasted Words and Who is Calling the Plays in Your Life. Remember, we stopped, at by, we stopped by saying the God of the universe is offering to be your speech writer. The God of the universe is offering to be your speech writer. And he is the one who knows our life, our work, and our relationships better than anyone else. All right? This is a big deal because words are a big deal to God. I know. I can tell just, just by how whew, people write stuff on social media. <laughs> I can tell how, how people respond on social media that they don't believe this that they don't believe words are a big deal to god they don't because if we understood that words are a big deal to god we certainly would not be going around cyber world telling people off cursing people out insulting people we wouldn't do it and i i can't speak for the world but I am talking about Christians. I'm talking about Christians. Yes, I am. I'm talking about the way that we talk to one another. 
Mm -hmm. We need help. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're in this book. Whenever God wanted to create something, he spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light. And there was light. He used words not merely to convey content, but to achieve his purpose to create something new. God doesn't speak simply because he is in a talkative mood, as many of us do. His words work out his will. Think about that. God understands and knows the power of his own words. And so he speaks. When he speaks, his purpose is to create something new. His words work out his will. So think about that. If I was, if I only practice speaking when I want my words to work something out, how much would I actually talk during the day? If I only wanted to speak to cause a shift or a positive change, how many times would I actually open my mouth to speak? Awesome, Ben. Awesome, Pastor Ben. How incredible is that? The God who made your mouth will also fill it. So here's a prayer. Here's a prayer for this week. God, fill my mouth when I need to say something. Mm -hmm. And God, close my mouth. If I'm getting ready to shipwreck my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good prayer. Lord, fill my mouth when I need to say something and close my mouth when I'm getting ready to shipwreck my life. Mm-hmm. We read, I am Yahweh your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. That's a popular scripture in uh, most Pentecostal churches. Psalm 81 verse 10. I, I used to hear that quite a bit. God will communicate to you so he can communicate through you and accomplish something beyond you. Say that again. God will communicate to you. That means you're receiving a revelation from God. You're receiving instruction from God. You're receiving a download from God. So that he can communicate through you and accomplish something beyond you. And prophets have to get really good at understanding and knowing what God is communicating to you and how much he's communicating to you should be released through you. Because not everything that God communicates to you is supposed to be released through you to other people. But that comes with maturity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> so, um, everything that God shares with you, his heart, his revelations, is not necessarily supposed to be public consumption. That's a whole other teaching. Wasted words. Let's move to our next section. Wasted words. Have you ever been in a conversation that left you feeling as if nothing was accomplished? Raising my hand. <laughs> Have you ever felt that the words were wasted? That happens a lot more than we realize, but that never happens with God's words. That's why he wants to be your speech writer. His words will never be wasted and his words always bring about his intended result. Isaiah 55 and 11 talks about how the word of the Lord goes out, waters the ground, and does not return to him void. I had a conversation, what was it, yesterday. <clears throat> you, can, you can tap the screen if you have already seen Wonder Woman, okay? My husband and I were kind of looking at some of the, the movie choice picks, and we decided to do a date, date night. And we went to go see Wonder Woman. And <clears throat> as I was going into the movie, we had plenty of time to kind of like 
you know, you get there early and they're doing the whole preview thing. So I'm on my phone, of course, doing some research on Wonder Woman. And um, I start researching the origin of Wonder Woman because I'm not really a big uh, superhero fan. I don't, you know, I, I, I have seen some of the movies, but I'm not into the whole comic book, DC Comics, how they all got started and the, you know, how the superheroes came to be. I mean, some people have the whole history down because they are fans of it, right? So I'm doing my research on Wonder Woman and I kind of, I come to find out that she is a combination character of the actual Amazon women who were real women and um, the Greek gods like Zeus and Ares and so, uh, and she's supposed to be, um, the Wonder Woman is actually supposed to be the goddess Diana, all right, who be, who is a child of the gods. And, um, yeah, so once I saw that piece, I was like, oh boy, oh boy, we're, we're in for interesting night here. <laughs> so <clears throat> I go to see the movie. We're already in the movie. I watched the movie and because I had started doing the background on it, I could see how they were utilizing Greek gods and Greek mythology, right? To pull people into this storyline. And if you haven't seen Wonder Woman, I won't spoil it for you. But I, I was interested in the beginning of the movie and how it got started. And I was interested in the end of the movie and how they chose to end it with this whole kind of savior message, right? So the middle part of the movie, I wasn't really excited about. Um, to me, as an artist, cinematically, the movie was re really, really, really dark, okay? So it was, it was kind of hard for me to like keep up visually with what was happening. That's just me personally. Nobody, hands up, don't shoot the messenger, okay? <laughs> so... Online, I was having this conversation with a young lady and she began to talk about um, how people were attacking this movie because, you know, nobody wanted to, um, nobody was attacking Superman and all these other things when they came out. So she was looking at it from a woman power standpoint. Well, I wasn't looking at it from a woman power standpoint. I was looking at it from the standpoint of this is the goddess Diana being portrayed as something good in the world with a savior message. Okay. And so in the conversation with her back and forth, I realized she was not going to ever get that point. <laughs> she wasn't going to get that point because in her mind, right? This movie was being attacked solely on the basis of, or this movie was being criticized solely on the basis of it being a woman. From my perspective, I didn't see that. I saw Greek gods being elevated into a saviorhood status above Christ. That's what I saw. So some people will go to see the movie and they'll be like, oh my gosh, this is an amazing movie. This is a fantastic movie. It's about, you know, redemption, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what I got out of it. I got out of it uh, as, you know, it's not, it, it might've represented that, but it was more so replacing the message of the gospel. That's what I got out of it. But that was only because I started doing some background into the character of woman, wonder woman and how she got started in the first place. So I said all that to say, sometimes you can have a conversation that leaves you feeling as if nothing was accomplished, which is what that conversation felt like for me. I even, you know, showed the lady, I said, right now, and you can go look this up. This is on my Daring Dialogues page, I believe. Right now, a lot of the white supremacists who have been stabbing and killing people they said that they have a common thread and the common thread is that these particular white supremacists 
worship, hear me, worship the Greek gods. So they don't see them as mythology. They actually worship them as their gods and they're taking orders from these quote unquote gods. All right. And so one thing, one thread that they're connecting to through these hate crimes is that these particular people that are committing them are worshiping these same gods that are in your entertainment. So whereas one person sees it as entertainment, this is why I said in one of my posts, another man's myth is another man's God. You may think it's a myth. You may think it's entertainment. You may think that it's not a belief system, but for some of these people, it is their belief system. And because it has to do with violence, they're actually acting out on the violence. Yes, and Thor was referenced in this in uh, Wonder Woman. So they're acting out on this violence. And if the only thing you can see is, oh my gosh, people are upset about woman power. <laughs> and you're not looking deeper into what is actually being represented in the movie. And how is it affecting our society right now and currently? then I don't know what to say. That's just a conversation that's probably going to, you know, go nowhere because we were on what two different pages about what was happening in the movie. She saw one thing. She saw womanhood being attacked. If anybody criticized the movie, I saw the Greek God element. And then I, then I started connecting it to the Greek gods that people are worshiping now and how it's actually causing real life consequences for black America. We were on two different wavelengths. So when you recognize that you stop talking, right? Well, at least I hope you do. <laughs> when you recognize that your conversation is not going anywhere, you just stop talking. You just give them a thumbs up and you say, okay, I understand your perspective, but clearly you don't understand mine. So let's keep it moving. God wants our speech to not be wasted. Yes, I agree. Even in our speech, we must move from this heightened level of sensitivity and defense. Prophet Jonathan, you are on it. Because what happens is if we have such a defensive nature then we can't ever hear another perspective, only our own, which leads us into tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, all right? So this raises some questions. How do you give God the job of allowing him to be your speechwriter and control your content? How do you have God maneuver your mouth so that you're saying precisely the right word for precisely the right moment. Jesus gives us the answer to those questions and more in John 12 and 49. He says, I have not spoken on my own, but the father himself who sent me has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. Now, I'm probably going to say something <laughs> that is going to maybe, hopefully it'll cause you to pause and think. But here's what I'm going to say. Jesus did not go around saying, thus saith the Lord on everything he said that was of the Lord. Let that sink in. Jesus did not go around saying, Thus said the Lord over everything that he was saying and teaching that was from the father. He's telling you right here, I'm not speaking of my own, but the father himself who sent me has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. Now, this is what I see often that happens. I'm seeing pastors apostles, prophets get disrespected and insulted 
when they're telling you what the Lord is saying, but they're not using thus saith the Lord. And this is where discernment in the body of Christ is lacking. And this is where um, you have to know the spirit by the spirit to know that a person is speaking from the spirit of the Lord and not out of their human spirit. This is going to become very, very important, perhaps in the next five to 10 years. The ability to be able to hear what someone is saying and recognize that they're talking from the spirit of the Lord. They're not just, they're not just talking, but they're telling you what the spirit of the Lord is saying. Because we have a generation that is not going to be walking around saying, thus saith the Lord, but they're going to be telling you exactly what the Lord is saying. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. They're not going to be using scripture addresses, but they're going to be speaking straight word to you. It's already happening. But if you know the word of God, then you know it's already happening. And if you know the word of God, when people speak, you will be able to hear the truth coming out of what they're saying to you. So we have to get out of this method and we have to get out of this mode of, and I'll give you an example. Prophet Jonathan does it all the time. Prophet Jonathan is always releasing the word of the Lord to men and women in relationships. And so all I do, I don't debate him. I don't get on his post and say, well, you know, you know, you don't need to be saying, no, no, no. All I do is say, amen, or I share it, or I might give some further insight into what he's saying. But he's speaking out of the spirit of the Lord to people. And just because he doesn't tack on, thus said the Lord in front of it, doesn't mean that it's not out of the spirit of the Lord. So I know that we have come from an age, right? We've come from a dispensation where if you were a prophet or you were a leader, every time you spoke something, you would say, thus saith the Lord, and then you would share it. People aren't doing that anymore. Very few people are doing that. So here's, here's, the, here's the necessary thing you need to understand. You have to walk in the spirit. You have to know the word of God in order to be able to recognize when the word of God is being spoken and when the revelation of the word of God is being released because people are not going around saying, thus saith the Lord, but some of them are speaking straight revelation from the spirit of God. So there are certain people that I follow because I know they are speaking straight revelation from the spirit of God and they're not saying, thus saith the Lord in front of it. I'm just telling you, all right? Just, just put a plug in that. Now, every word that the son of God said was perfect. It was well-timed and it accomplished the intended outcome. This is because he, when he talked, he spoke only the words God told him to say. He had such an abiding and submissive relationship with the father that God's words became his own. That's where we want to be. That we are so living and abiding in God that we're hearing from the father that we began to have our conversation be his conversation. That when we speak, we're giving people what God is saying to us, through us, to them, that they can receive it. All right? We're going to stop here for part one. We're going to come back in 60 seconds, and we're going to work on part two. We're talking about wasted words and who is calling the play. I hope that you'll come back and join me in 60 seconds for part two of Daring Dialogues.